Hello, I'm Andrea and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this sculpture. This is a sculpture by Richie Caput. He's a West Australian artist. It's made of steel, which has been painted black. It's a figure which is standing at about a, just over a metre high, but it's hunched over. And what the right hand of this figure is holding a walking stick. And the walking stick has a cane, um, curved metal top, and then turns into wood with a rubber stopper on the end. So it's a pretty everyday kind of walking stick. The artist, Richie, has used mild steel, which is quite a thin metal. And he has used it in a similar way that you might uh, sew a dress uh, using a paper pattern. So it's quite, although it's heavy, it's quite thin steel. And if you can hear, I'm knocking on the side of the figure where the dress is. And you can hear that hollow kind of knocking sound and that gives us an idea of how thin this steel is. So it's hollow inside. The figure is hunched over, like I said before, and is wearing a, an enormous um, headdress piece which has a pattern very faintly etched onto it. Now most artists are trying to tell us about an idea that they've had or tell us a story or they're trying to tell us something about the process that they used to make the artwork. In this case Richie is asking us to think about our life's journey and this hunched over figure is an older person who has probably had a very interesting and varied life. All right, this is a sculpture by Britt Mickelson and it's called Anthropocenic. And the Anthropocene period refers to a period of time where our human interactions with the environment is having the most impact, so pretty much now. And Britt has found this big lump of stone which she had transported into her workshop. It's uh, some kind of granite from the southwest of Australia. And she has added onto the stone some uh, amber-like material over the top of a house. So if I look really, really closely into this big blob of yellow coloured material, I can see a house, the roof, I can see into the backyard of some people sunbathing, I can see a child jumping on a trampoline and some people stand, uh, sitting around a backyard table having a meal or a drink together. Now Britt is trying to get us to think about our actions and our impact on the environment but also think to the future what will our world or our city look like in a million years to an anthropologist or a fossil hunter finding our city encased in amber. The artist Brit has Norwegian heritage and amber is a big thing in Norway. Amber jewellery, bracelets, necklaces, things like that. And the thing about amber is that it is millions of years old and sometimes uh, tiny little animals or creatures have been trapped in the amber, uh, especially insects. And so I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called Jurassic Park, but they extract DNA, dinosaur DNA, from a mosquito that is entrapped in amber. And they use that DNA to create new dinosaurs. So Brit 
is kind of thinking about the same thing here. She has encased her world, her house, her neighbourhood, houses, trucks, people, playgrounds, schools in amber for a future geologist or anthropologist to find and wonder what happened to these people. Was it what we've done to the environment that has caused our cities to die and become encased in amber? Hi, my name's Leslie and I'm going to talk to you about this piece behind me by Tim McFarlane Reed. It's about landscape. In his brief in the book, he's actually inviting you to share the experience of landscape. Now, landscape, as we presume in life, is all about what we drive over or what we see in the distance. Landscape in art is somewhat different. Now, this is made of aluminium. It's rather a compact piece, I suppose. It's probably one, two, three metres in length and probably in two metres in height. And in width, it's probably, again, about one and a half to two metres. The landscape area of it all is all about the planes on the pieces. So it goes around in curves and flats, and then it takes you on sort of a railway in a theme park sort of journey and it swirls you around all these landscapes where your eye goes around and goes whoosh way up to the top. Underneath the piece in the aluminium it's textured. It has a roughness with a sort of a black patina rubbed into it and then sort of washed off or grounded off. So you can actually see the texture. If the blackness wasn't there you wouldn't see it. It was sort of blend into the piece and you would have to get up close or even feel it. With this you can actually see it. It sort of gives it a skin, it gives it a meaning of life or a relationship to the individual. So and then you can go right down to the ground where it's balanced off and the textures become more uneven. You can even see a few little grind marks that are done on the aluminium. This is a really nice, flowing, visual, and even some of the textures on the bigger pieces have a Celtic look about them. Others are sort of look like acids being dropped. And then you have these ones on here that have a Celtic feeling about it. I don't know if that's intentional or it's just my interpretation, but I like it. It's, it's a really nice sort of piece. And then it just, see, you can go right up here in the shininess and you go hurtling around and then you go all the way and you follow the journey of the whole piece over this glorious landscape of aluminium. Quite delicious, actually. I hope you come along and enjoy it. So I'm sure Tim would too. So enjoy. This piece here, which is an absolute beauty, is by a local artist, Yuko. Now, Yuko is a bronze sculptor who works at the Jay Shed down in Fremantle. She's exhibited here over the last couple of years and has done extremely well. Her style is all about simplicity. It's all about the line, the linear of the work that she does. See how it just flows all the way over there, comes back and it makes you travel down the piece. And then it comes back and makes you go up in the smooth. And then she does the real opposite by the antlers are actually little nuts from the local native bushes here and the branches of wood. So they're not typical as you would see antlers on a deer. So this is bronze. It's made out of clay first and then they're done in a mould and the process keeps going forward and it's poured bronze into those and then it's all welded together, grounded down smooth 
And then she finishes off with this lovely green patina. Now the patina is painted on to the bronze and heated up. And when it cools down a bit, it's sealed with the wax. So it doesn't come off in your hands. This will be like this forever. And it's an absolutely beautiful piece. So it comes down and it sits on a bronze base. Again, this has been made separately. This has been done and then it's been welded to the base. So it ain't going anywhere. She's a lovely, lovely artist. She does small pieces as well as the larger ones. She would have a small, lovely piece in the smaller exhibition. So if you get to see either of them, you can compare how she works in the larger pieces and then transforms her ability to work in bronze into the smaller concept of her work. She's very, very good. So again, come down and enjoy seeing her work. This is a sculpture by Ryan Shaw. It's called Birds of a Feather. And that title gives us a clue about what this artwork is all about. It's two quite uh, slim structures made of aluminium. They are standing next to each other. One of the big features of this work is the colour. So if we start at the bottom of one of the structures, it's black, changes to yellow, then red with a bit of black going all the way up to the height of just over two metres. So they're very tall, skinny aluminium forms. They're wobbling around a bit in the wind right now. And in the middle, in the middle at about the six foot mark, you know, 1.8 metres, these two structures are joined together by feather shapes. And like I said before, the title of the work is Birds of a Feather, so that gives us a clue. These are feathers, and they are red-tailed black cockatoo feathers, an endangered bird in Western Australia. So these feather shapes are made from aluminium and they've been powder coated which with paint that's what gives them the different colors so we've got black yellow and red they're very very smooth to touch and the forms are very uh, curved and rounded so whereas if you had a real feather in your hand it would have texture and it would be quite pointy at the end these shapes are more rounded as I run my hand across them. And the artist has been quite clever in where he has used the bolts that join the different layers of aluminium together because we've got one, two, three, four, five sections all joined together with a, a bolt through the middle. Uh, he's been very strategic about where he has placed those bolts so it doesn't interfere with the look or even with the feel of those shapes and they are bolted together which gives it a lot of strength but there's still a bit of movement in the wind as the wind blows these feathers around. The reason why Ryan has joined the structures in the middle is he wants it to give the impression of two figures holding hands walking along the beach. So he's turning these feather shapes into human shapes. This is a piece by a WA French artist. Lucky person living in two of the most beautiful places. Monia Allegra. Now I'm going to read what she said about her piece, just one line. So she said that the paddles echo the movement of the swell. So it's aluminium 
and steel. So when you come up and look at it, you can see the differences between the metals here. You know, the steel piping that we all know. So you've got to ask yourself, why would they actually use two different metals? When, when it's sealed, it looks the same. So when we come across Moni, we'll ask her and just see what happens about it. But it looks really good. The paddles, as you can see, start here. The steel is welded into a swirling frame. The ocean could be representation of a wave. So it goes around and you follow it till it ends back on the ground again. Paddles in the ocean use for us to get along in a canoe, in a boat, uh, life-saving boats which are used here on the beach all the time. So it's been used with all this wind swirling around. If it was not stationary, it would be hurtling around like a windmill. So it can have a sort of a windmill effect to you as well. It's got the movement attached which paddlers work. So if or when you come down here and move, come down and look at it, you need to look at it and see how the paddles are immersed in the sand. You could think that would represent the ocean, the sea, the movement, and it's stuck in there and so forth. It's quite an individual piece that could be interpreted according to the weather. You've got the rush ocean behind us, which is quite rough with the wind going across. Tomorrow it could be flat calm, whereas the concept of the piece would be completely different. It's a very environmentally changing piece as I see it. And if you look at it that way as well, you could see that. It's very smooth, in touch, no surface tactile movements, nothing that ruffles the fingers. So sort of chopstickish when you hold them and let them go and they fall in this sort of random area. So when you come down, have a look at it, ask some questions of it and see if you agree with what the artist is trying to say or if they succeed in telling you what they're trying to say. Enjoy. This is quite a large sculpture. It's a good three metres wide and nearly two metres high. It looks like a giant seed pod or possibly the bones of a whale carcass that's been washed up from the beach and has landed here on the sand. But if we look closely, it's made of lots of different segments of tin. And in fact, these tins are cat food tins. So there's 3,000 cat food tins that have been assembled together by the artists to make this big whale carcass or seed pod structure on the sand. And a lot of time artists are trying to tell a story or trying to communicate with us or tell us an idea that they've got. And so what might be the idea behind this? Why would an artist use 3,000 cat food tins to create something that looks like a whale carcass washed up on the beach? Have a think about what you might have in your own homes that is used every day and then thrown away. And then have a think about the effect that all of this rubbish has on our natural environment. And that gives you some clues to the idea or the story that the artists are telling us. So they're basically asking us to think about the things that we use every day, the waste products from those things, and the effect that that might have on the environment. Now they've called this artwork fossil. 
and as we know fossils are the re remains of ancient creatures that can be found out in the environment. So they're trying to make a comment of what will be left behind as evidence of our humanness and maybe we should think a bit more carefully about what we're doing with our waste. I wonder if you could think of making a sculpture from something that normally you would throw away at home. Maybe out of tins, maybe out of cardboard packaging, maybe even out of a box. You could stick lots of boxes together and paint them. You could make your own sculpture that tells the story about recycling at your place. Right, here we are. I love this piece, really good. It's Neil Turner, WA artist. He's called it uh, dross, meaning rubbish. So I don't have to tell you what they are, just by looking at them, you know at what they are, the old amphoras. I've actually seen real ones over in Greece, as probably everybody has who's been there. They were used as cargo holders, like our, you know, things we put on ships now that we put cars into, we pack it up, move from country to country. These vessels carted wheat, they carted oil, they carted wine on ships, they were made the shape so they could stack them into the old cargo ships of the ancient times and move them between the countries of Greece and Italy, the Roman Empire. They were great sea traders, so they were usually used on ships. When the ships sank in the olden days, still full of their beautiful cargoes and, you know, the wines, they were, went to the bottom of the sea. And archaeologists of today find them at the bottom of the, the Mediterranean, most for us. So these ones have a beautiful coloured blue patina on them, which makes it look like it's bronze or a copper, but they're not. They're Jessamite quite, there's no hollowness or pinginess that you get from, from a metal. So there's one, two, three, four, five, there's five of them. And by looking at them, I'm not knowing this, but by looking at them, they all look the same size. So I would gather that Neil has made one in clay and done a mould so that he could get them all a repeat one. I may be right, but anyway, that's the way I do it. He's roped it together nicely with this lovely piece of old rope, which obviously stops it from rolling away, but kind of joins them together. You know, in the olden days, these big ropes were plaited and twined and used on the ships to pull the sails up, to anchor the ships to, you know, the piers and so forth. So it's a really lovely piece. And, you know, you can ask questions more before when you look at them within your a group. You can go online and look up what they were used for and what countries, you know. They were used all around the Mediterranean, from the Grecian countries right down to Sparta, in, um, in the Peloponnese in Greece, and right across to Tunisia and the northern shores of Africa and so forth. So they're beautiful. The structure of them, the shape of them are just absolutely lovely, quite feminine in the style and the shape that they are. So, and half being half buried, you know, the sand itself now on this windy day is actually covering them more, and then the sand will, will be blown away by the wind coming again. So it's a really moving piece of structure around. They're solid, but they're sitting in a moving feast of sand. So I really love this piece. It's just simple, but really gorgeous. So when you come down, have a look and see what you think of it. This is a sculpture by Merle Topsy Davis. Now Merle lives uh, near the beach down south around Bunbury Way and she spends a lot of time collecting things that she has found at the beach, basically doing beach cleanups. Now she has often said that 
One of the reasons why she makes art is to say something. It's not to make money as such as being an artist, but it's to actually say something about the state of the world. So if we have a closer look at this sculpture, it's made of lots and lots and lots of different pieces of rope. Some of the rope is quite thick. Some of the rope is very thin strands. It all appears to be plastic based rope. And Mel says that she finds this rope at the beach when she's doing beach cleanups. She finds uh, cleaning up the beach to be quite a meditative process. So it's something a, a little bit like mindfulness, I guess, walking along the beach and noticing what has been washed ashore. And all of these things on her sculptures are things that have been washed ashore. So there's ropes, there are plastic floats, there are also these uh, plastic reels that a uh, fishing line is attached to or sometimes fishing floats that are attached to. And she has assembled them into three separate but intertwining creatures that stand, the tallest one is probably about two metres high. Uh, the others are all above a metre and a half because they are taller than me. I'm about a metre and a half high. And they have, they look like sea anemones, basically. So big circular shapes on the end of cylindrical forms. They're waving around in the wind. It's quite windy in Cottesloe this afternoon while I'm talking to you. They're very, very brightly coloured. Lots of green, purple, yellow, blue, orange, red really bright and colourful and happy looking. But what she's trying to say here is that there's a lot of waste and that it's having an effect on the ocean. Uh, and she'd like you to have a think next time you're at the beach, or maybe even if you're having a walk through the bush, notice the things around you that probably shouldn't be there and have a little think about how our waste is affecting the environment. Here we are from the Jones Studios, Tony Jones, etc. Lovely sculpture, aluminium. That's it, just aluminium. It's about three metres tall, which is a good height. It doesn't overpower you, doesn't make you feel too little, but it doesn't make you feel too big. It has three pieces of aluminium curling up to represent the seagrass. And on the top, settled between two of the seagrass reeds, is a little boat. Quite lovely, actually. There is one piece of the steel which is not connected to the boat and I can actually feel it moving in the wind. It's vibrating, it's really quite lovely. You can see it shimmering a little bit with the blue sky in the distance. So the other two aren't shimmering at all because the boat is securing them. Now the thing about seagrass it is so important to the survival of so many sea animals. In our own Coburn Sound, our seagrass is disappearing through the use of it, through the shipping, through the mining of sea sand, which they do there, which has been going on for years. So the seagrass is disappearing. It holds the elements of the basin together. The seagrass up north with the dugons, which I'm sure you're all aware, they're, to me they are like the big hippopotamuses of the ocean. They sort of lumber across the seabed where the seagrass is grazing. They're just gorgeous and they're large and their seagrass is disappearing all over the world. So it's just, you know, it's just a thing what's happening today. So I think the artists, the sculptors have done really well with this. It has a, a natural flow, so if the water 
is flowing past the seagrass and forming this natural curve that goes over. So, and it's, you can walk around it, get a feeling with the vibrations. So what they're depicting, I think they've actually done very, very well. And with the small boat, when you look up at it, it's got, it's, you can see through it, you can see the blue sky through the boat, and in the distance, even see the sun, which is really quite glary today, coming through the boat and giving you a sense of movement in this. It's really, and the boat is a brownish colour settling on the silverness of the aluminium. So the contrast is really quite lovely. It's not hot to touch, which is quite nice. So it's a good piece to question about what's happening, especially to our seagrass. It makes you think, hopefully will bring up the conversation of what's going on within the waterbeds around the world, especially here in Perth, where our own seagrass is slowly disappearing. Great piece. We're having a look at a sculpture by an artist named Mike Green. The title of the work is actually untitled 621. So that makes it a little bit trickier for us to try and work out what the story is behind this artwork or what the idea that Mike's trying to communicate to us. So it's a series of metal poles that have been bent into shapes and they're poking up or sticking up from the ground. They look a bit like metal paper clips but they're giant sized. They're forming a kind of lots of triangle shapes um, or even you could say zigzags. So the tallest one is over two meters high and it's a really bright uh, almost fluorescent lime green colour and it's bending down to the ground where it does a sharp bend and zigzags across to my left from where I'm standing and this it's kind of like a line I guess it's a it's a squiggly line that is um, basically going down and then up again as it moves through the space. And some of these lines or these poles are crisscrossing against each other. Now, I had a look at the artist's statement, which is where the artist writes something in the catalogue about the work. And he said that it's trying to represent music or musical notes. And so that helped me work it out a little bit more. So I see now when I'm looking at it, the, the top part of these poles where they really reach up into the sky, some of them nearly, you know, more than two metres high up in the air, could be seen as the top notes, the really high notes in a song. And then right down onto where the grass is are the low notes. And this music is bouncing all around the space with high notes, low notes and notes in between and maybe i'm not sure this maybe you guys could help me out with this maybe the different colors because we've got light blue um, a darker blue we've got the fluorescent green and a kind of creamy red color maybe they could represent the loudness or the softness of these music notes bouncing around the space. So I'm not really sure. A lot of the time uh, the artists are really clear about what they're trying to tell us and we can see straight away from the colours or the shapes or the materials that they've used. Other times it takes a little bit more time to work it out or Maybe it just becomes whatever you think it might mean and whatever speaks to you from this artwork. Is it music? Is it beams of light? Is it just simply poles, different coloured poles that make an interesting shape sitting on the grass at Cottesloe Beach?
This is a great piece. It's by Fiona Gavino, and I'm reading, it's the Bendite Family Foundation WA Invited Artist. It's a large piece. It's made out of cane. It falls all over the ground, sort of stumbles across the ground, goes up the tree, falls down onto the ground again, and then the other piece sort of disappears up into the tree and waving itself around all the, the branches. It's quite lovely. It's, you could look at it, as the artist says, it's a repetition of weaving. Weaving is repetition. There's absolutely no sort of obvious repeating style here. Just bits of cane woven, entwined, in circulars and so forth. I know that a lot of basket weavers, when they use cane to weave the baskets today and of old, the cane is actually a lot thicker. And you, sometimes and you have to soak it in water to make it pliable because it can be quite hard to weave. This cane is quite gentle, not only on the eye, because it's all sort of a creamy colour, but I would say it would be quite gentle on the hands to weave. And you could just feel yourself getting lost in the weaving patterns. When you walk along the piece, you come across a sort of a tunnelling. Now, in the olden days, and even in today, especially the Aboriginals, and even the Aboriginals of any country who live by the ocean, they would weave these sorts of fish traps. I've seen them, actually. And it just reminded me then that the fish would go into the place the nets in the water and the fish would get caught in the, the weaving traps, you know. This is just my looking at and interpreting. I'm not sure if the artist did this, but as you as an individual, just a, a normal person like me to come along and you look at it and it does bring up bits from the travels that you've done in your life through your studies or through your life or through pictures or reading books. It's a lovely, lovely piece that does bring those sorts of things up for you. It has a, a lovely, gentle technique on your hands. And the good thing about this is that this sort of weaving is something that we can all do. It, it doesn't make itself pretentious. It, you look at it and think, Gosh, I could do that, and really you can, but you've really got to sit down, put a lot of time into it, and you can let it take you wherever it wants to go. And this artist has done really, really well. Fiona's let it travel across the land. She's chosen this tree, wrapped itself around it, and just let it hang there. And it's really a delightful piece. And when you come and look at it, just think what it does remind you of and where it can take you. And maybe it might inspire you to take up weaving in any shape or form, not naturally in cane, but you can use anything, really. You know the old cotton reels where you would bang the nails at the top and you'd weave the little bits of wool around, you'd make that long thing come out and it would grow. It's where a lot of artists start off. It's a, it's a lovely piece, so when you come and look at it, just ask some questions of where it might lead you if you took up weaving cane or anything else. Enjoy it. This is a sculpture by Sally Stoneman. She has exhibited a lot of her work at Sculpture by the Sea over the years. This particular sculpture is all about marking time. And it tells the story of when Sally went to Japan and she went on this particular walk, which is a pilgrimage walk. And along the way, there were several cans, which are like piles of stone, that were wayfaring or markers of the journey. And that got her thinking about her own journey but also the journey of our planet, of our environment. And so she's trying to tell us about those ideas that she's got in her head through this sculpture. 
So it stands about oh, six foot tall, about 1.8 metres. It's taller than me. It's in three sections and this top section, which is a teardrop kind of shape with a very, very pointy top, is made of wire and the wire has been twisted and rolled and turned to form a very dense teardrop kind of shape. That is sitting on a very spherical or like a globe shape, like a big kind of map of the world or an earth shape. It's the same wire and this wire is actually reclaimed from the rabbit proof fence. Now, I don't know if you have heard of the rabbit proof fence before but in Western Australia uh, back in the 1890s I think they were really worried about how many rabbits were coming into Western Australia so they built a great big fence out of wire to keep the rabbits out and it didn't work and there's a lot of this wire still out there and Sally goes out to farming properties in the Murchison so up in the, the north and slightly northeast of Perth and asks the farmers there if she can collect the wire off their property and she uses it to make her sculptures. So we've got two shapes, a teardrop shape sitting on a big sphere or rounded kind of shape and then it's sitting on a very naturally found piece of rock from Sally's property down south. She lives uh, southeast of Perth, about three hours drive away. She hasn't done anything to this rock. It's not like the wire on top, which she has really worked and made into these shapes. The rock is just how she found it on her property. It actually looks like she's cut it with some kind of stone cutting tool. Some of the edges are really, really sharp and there are lots of square and rectangular geometric shapes there, but she hasn't used any tools on this. This is the Earth's work over millions of years, water and wind and pressure from the sand and other rocks have formed this rock shape. And she's made this work to mark the passing of time. So she has an ancient rock down the bottom here that nature has carved. And on top is sitting two shapes made of wire that she has made. 